Me and Swanson, uh, I'm a vice president at uh, Oracle uh, on product management team, and I'm really trying to spearhead AI and machine learning at Oracle. And as uh, I was introduced, I actually came from an acquisition. So uh, huge kudos to the people that are like starting companies in this audience asking for new recruiting on employees or even just doing the elevator pitch. I've been there multiple times over in my career. But I, I founded datascience.com about five years ago. So I was CEO, I was founder of datascience.com. Um, I came over from American Express. I sold a company to American Express in 2011. And the challenges that I saw at a big finance company, as well as big telecom I was at before, I was even at AOL, was we weren't leveraging our data. We weren't exploiting the value in all of our data. And so when I left American Express, it was, I want to build tools for data scientists. You know, I want people to be able to finally get value out of their data. And so on our journey to Oracle, what we did is we started by ramping up a team of data scientists. Now, it's a little bit easier to hire data scientists if you're a domains datascience.com. You know, we had like 1,000 people knocking on our door saying they want to be part of the company every month. But we hired 50 of the best data scientists that we could find. They were truly amazing. And we started by doing data science as a service. So many large companies would come to us in automotive and healthcare and finance, and they would give us their data science challenges. And then we would actually be the people that would write the models that would go into production. But as we were doing that, we spun up an engineering and a product team that were building tools and solutions for our data scientists to use. Tools to help them collaborate, tools for workflow, tools to have them get access to data in an easy way, and compute power to build and train models and eventually put models into production. So that product we brought to the market, we called it the datascience.com platform. Uh, we brought it to market about two years ago. We signed up some really big customers. Um, we have teams where there might be you know, 10, 12 data scientists within a particular company using our product to over 1,000 data scientists, so big teams of data scientists. And we joined Oracle. Um, it was announced in, uh, in May of 2018. So it's, it's still new. It's still incredibly exciting, and it's going to be exciting for the future. Um, we had a few companies approach us for acquisition. And um, when Oracle approached, we really got to understand the ecosystem of AI that lives within Oracle. And you're going to see more and more of that over the couple months, or coming months, that's going to make Oracle really stand out in the AI space. Um, one of my friends, uh, DJ Patil, he used to be the chief data scientist under Obama. And before that, he was at LinkedIn, where he actually coined the term, or at least was given credit for coining the term data science and data scientist. And um, in partnering with DJ, we really wanted to build a environment, a platform, that pulled together a team. Because data science done right is really a team sport. And in joining Oracle, it's not just about team as in people in this room, but it's also an ecosystem of products. And so I'm going to get out of Oracle speak here pretty soon and, and on a topic. But at Oracle, we're part of a, a bigger vision. Um, we're part of what we call the autonomous big data platform, all the way from data integration to our data lake infrastructure, which Again, you have credits right now to use, so you have $500 of credits for everyone in this audience. Please use these products, these services. And then we have analytics, AI, machine learning, and that's where datascience.com sits. Is, for any attendee tonight? Yes. is the $500 credits for any attendee tonight? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Thank yes. You. It's yes. Okay. So this is the Oracle Data Science Cloud. This is the product um, that we brought over to Oracle. It's exciting. Um, the data science cloud is comprised of a workspace that is very collaborative. It's integrated into the infrastructure stack, and it's enterprise grade. It's secure. It's a place for data scientists to access data, build models, and put models into production. And it really encompasses the entire data science workflow, um, where you might have multiple collaborators, you know, people on the business side of things, from data scientists to IT, working together to give access to data, to explore data, to build models, deploy models, and manage models. Now, here we get into my presentation. It all starts with data. So this, people have been talking about this for years, so this is not a new slide. Um, this slide, it says data is the new oil. We've, we've been talking about that going back five years, 10 years, more actually. But data is at the foundation of, of what we do. Um, you know, Data enables us to go through a digital transformation if we truly use it. 
So I wanted to start off by talking about, yes, data is the new oil, but then it jumps into data science. Um, how many people in the room are data scientists? One, two, three. Awesome. So I'm going to speak um, in a way that, one, introduce you to the space, give you some ammunition um, for your meetings at work, um, but also talk about, from a, a business level perspective, how can we get started in data science, and what are some of the things that are critical? Um, as we get into the next speaker, I'm sure the next speaker is going to go uh, a couple levels deeper on the technology. Now, when I start, I like to talk about what is data science. And there's a lot of buzz terms out there, um, all the way from AI, machine learning, uh, deep learning, and data science. And I remember one of my first days um, actually at Oracle where someone said, hey, you know, data science, um, that's that thing people used to do. We do AI now. Well, AI is comprised within data science. You know, data science is about how do we extract insights from data. This is if you Wikipedia the definition. Extract insights from data using multiple methods. And those methods might be utilizing AI, uh, machine learning, deep learning. And the thing that I like to really emphasize, or I should say add to the Wikipedia definition, is it's not about leveraging data science and these techniques to extract insights from data. Everybody in this room should be concerned about how do we use those insights and how do we put those insights to action. That, to me, is the most critical part of data science because otherwise, all we're doing is exploring data. We're not using data. The other key term I, I want to talk about in this uh, discussion is digital transformation. So digital transformation is the, the use of technologies to create new business models, to improve products. It's about how do we use the data. And kind of driving this, this revolution of data science, and I'll get into why I brought up digital transformation, is this revolution that we're seeing, this revolution of traditional data mining all the way through to what we view as a much more modern cloud-native data science approach. And so if I were to focus on a few of these areas, what we've seen 10 years ago, 15 years ago, um, and even five years ago in some cases, were scattered, specialized scientists and teams. Now, when we go and we work with companies, people are collaborating, people are working together. They're no longer soloists within a company that might sit in an ivory tower, they're part of a team. So think about all the stuff that we have learned and grown from best engineering practices. We're now starting to see that pulled over onto the data science side of the house. Um, on traditional data mining, it was expensive, inelastic compute. Um, now, elasticity, it's, it's a commodity. Um, we have high-end, we have GPU machines. We used to have specialized proprietary tools in data mining, um, tools like SAS or SPSS. And now we see the rise of, of open source. There's a really interesting survey. One of my friends runs um, th the best recruiting firm for data scientists, uh, Linda Birch. It's birchworks.com. And she does an amazing survey where she surveys uh, literally thousands of data scientists and asks, what's your language of choice? And the language of choice right now are, are open languages, open tools. So people are writing code now, data scientists, exploring data in R and Python and Scala, and they're not just concentrating in proprietary languages like SAS. Manual model development, to now we're leveraging machine learning libraries and packages and frameworks. Um, I have a customer that uses 682 different machine learning libraries across two teams of data scientists. And, and that's, again, the, the power of innovation of open source is because it's not just proprietary solutions where they're buying one and hopefully it fits, they're leveraging an ecosystem. And then complex custom de uh, deployment. This gets into within the data science stack, and as we get to be more modern and uh, cloud native, is integrated model ops. That's key. Um, the COO of BlackRock was talking about, and I'm just going to read this out, AI may be in a big hype cycle, but there's no doubt that the technology is real and changing the world already. Um, who believes AI is in a hype cycle right now? So I actually kind of, I agree, even though I'm the AI machine learning guy. And uh, I was at a round table of uh, business executives for a company. So this was not the engineers. These were not the data scientists. This was not IT in the room. These were CXO you know, people. And I asked, whom, how many of you believe this is hype? None of them raised their hands. I said, I do. And the reason why is we know how to do data science right now. You don't know how to actually use it. 
And that was for the business people you know, that were in the room. And so the, the whole pitch there was, how do I consume data science in my business decisions? And I think once we figure that out, then we get beyond the hype. Now, our uh, CEO, Mark, um, has been quoted saying, AI will become integrated into everything. It's not a question of if, but when. This has everything to do with macroeconomics, business model strategy, and technology. And when you start to see um, stats like this one, this one says there's $3.5 trillion in potential annual AI-derived business value across 19 key industries. <laughs> if this is real, then of course, you know, it's gonna be key that we integrate AI into what we're doing at the business level. Now, data science is not just for one particular industry, but more important than that, it's not just for one particular function within your company. So when I go over a slide like this one, it's yes, there are use cases in government and automotive and gaming and you know, somebody talked about e-commerce, there's plenty of use cases in e-commerce. But sometimes we look at data science within our company in a pretty narrow lens. We might only focus on a few key areas. Like we might focus on the product, making product enhancements, maybe recommendation systems if you are an e-commerce site. It's like one of those first products we show on that first page. But the reality is data science done right really sits at the heart of the company. And so I, I brought up a slide before my friend DJ Patil who coined the term data scientist and when I was first starting my company, like any entrepreneur in this room, you're pitching venture capitalists, you're asking for money, and the venture capitalists are saying, who are the buyers? Who's paying for this? Who cares about the solution that you're selling? So I asked DJ that question. I was like, you're the voice of this space. Whose pie is this? CMO pie, CIO, CTO pie? And he said, Ian, you're thinking about it wrong. It's CEO pie, because data science done right affects the entire company. Now I'm going to get into my, my transition into data science and digital transformation. Um, digital transformation is a term that's sitting at every boardroom right now. It's a super big buzzword term. And digital transformation is, again, about how do I exploit an enterprise's data to build and enhance products and services, enable more efficient operations and processes, and create new channels and business models. At the end of the day, how do we use our data to increase revenue, reduce costs, make better customer experiences. Every single CEO is looking at this mandate right now and challenging their team to really become and go through this digital transformation effort. Um, gone are the days of just storing data. Now it's how are we using data? And so we have to pay that bill right now. And the way we pay that bill is by focusing on these three key areas. So to dive in this a little bit deeper, customer experience, operational process, business model. On the customer experience side, um, how do we make sure that we're, we're touching the customer at the right times with the right message, so whether it's email marketing? Um, why, how are we enabling our customer service operators to be able to have the, the right escalation processes and talk tracks based on the customer coming in? Business model. How are we creating new business models? You know, and how are we leveraging our data to be able to do that? There's so many use cases, but at the end of the day, it says digital capabilities. And I view digital cap capabilities as outputs. And this is where it starts to tie, tie things together. So data science use cases could be in the form of APIs as outputs, insights as reports, applications that are being created, or even just scheduling jobs of data that might just happen every night, scoring new batches of data. But each one of these, whether it's lifetime value, customer churn, uh, risk management, doing transactional data in the ETL, all of these go back to trying to figure out digital capabilities within digital transformation. Now, to be able to do this, and to be able to do this effectively, um, we see that there are three core building blocks for data science success. Um, clearly there's more, this is kind of marketing speak right now, I'm gonna talk about the three T's. The three T's are team, technology, and technique. These are the areas that I would definitely focus on from an investment perspective. So team. So digital transformation requires a team effort. It requires C-level business leaders plan, high-level strategy and goals. The line of business performs the actions, in many cases, getting the result. IT needs to provide the access to data, the tools, and then data scientists are the ones that are exploring, identifying, building models, and helping put those models in production. The bottom line is it's a team sport. 
So when I said I, I started a company by doing data science as a service, and then we built a product, meaning we had to know the problems we were trying to solve by doing the work ourselves and then build the right product. In doing that, we worked with quite a few interesting customers. Um, we worked with a customer that was a subscription business model. It wasn't Netflix, but it's a company that sells a monthly subscription. And the project they had us work on was create a customer churn score on an individual you know, user basis. So every month, we built this model that would update all their users, and it would say, Bob's going to cancel in the next three months, 96% chance. Ian's going to cancel you know, maybe in the next year, but there's like 36% chance you know, on that. But from this list, you think about it, it should be gold. Because if you're talking about a subscription business, the subscription business is how do I acquire new customers and how do I keep those customers and just keep growing that business. So we gave them this list and then months went by and months went by and I talked to the CEO and I said, how are you guys using that churn list? That churn list must be gold for you guys. Oh, we're using it in some board meetings in terms of financial forecasts. That's it? That's it? That's crazy. And the reason why is they didn't have it being a team sport. And so we went back into that company after talking to the CEO and I said, no, no, no. We need to do a cross-functional exercise on this data. And so they pulled together, it's kind of a quirky, weird term, they called it the Churn Squad. A movie at this time called Suicide Squad came out, so they named it the Churn Squad. But the Churn Squad was comprised of marketing, customer service, product people, finance, all of them came together on this list every two weeks and tried to figure out how do we activate against this list. So what's one way that this team was trying to figure out how to activate against this list? A way was, if we're understanding the likelihood that someone's gonna cancel, when they call in to our customer service department, we immediately, immediately need that score to populate on the screen to say, Ian's likely to cancel. Maybe we also populate with what my lifetime value is gonna be. And then start to automate the process of the various talk tracks. Maybe there's new offers that they can give me to try to save me and understand the likelihood of that. But the bottom line is, it was going to go nowhere unless it was a team sport. Everybody had to come together to be able to activate against the data. Okay, uh, building block number two, uh, technology. We need technology that scales. Um, technology that scales will deliver work to production. Um, so as we take a look at what is needed for data scientists, um, it, it was a, it's a hard problem to solve. When we hired, again, only 50 data scientists in my company, now Oracle has well over 1,000 data scientists, what we found is every single data scientist was walking in and had different flavors of tools. Yeah. So I like to work on my laptop, or I like to work in the cloud, or I like to work in uh, Jupyter versus our studio and Zeppelin, Python versus SAS. Um, you know, I like Auto SK Learn, I like Teapot, like everything was different between them. And so what we needed was a common environment for them to be able to collaborate and work together, an environment that was backed by infrastructure, get off the local machine, get an infrastructure that can actually scale, and give them the, the connections to access data in a secure way, give them the tools that they want, all the powerful open source tools, for them to be able to explore that data, build models, and put models into production. And another key part of that was centralize the workflow. So centralize the workflow and encourage collaboration. Um, I don't want to say it was completely shocking, but um, data scientists were used to not working on big teams. I mean, they work on teams in research and academia, but as soon as they got into uh, technology, especially in the earlier days of this, this space, they would often work on their own island or their own ivory tower or maybe be on a small team of a couple people. Even though a company might have hundreds of data scientists, they were locked into particular uh, lines of business. Now, here, here's what was shocking about that is, as you start working with customers, you find out that across all the functions of the business, there's some similar use cases being solved. So one group's doing lifetime value analysis over here, and so's the other group. And so having one place, a platform to build a centralized workflow and have a place where they're able to collaborate you start seeing that there's a lot of assets being shared, back and forth. People are working together. People are sharing code. They're sharing the ways that they're accessing the data, what in the data is important, um, how they're building the models. And we have, a, we have a customer, 
that's the metric they track, is how many of these assets they're sharing. Because data scientists, it's, they're hard to find. The average tenure for a data scientist in Bay is actually less than 11 months, just so people know. So they're hard to find, they're hard to keep. And so while we have them, we need to make sure that we get value out of them. And so one way by doing that is to speed up the time to value, and we could do it by better workflows, collaboration, and technology tools can help. Embrace open source, encourage standards, and empower users to be self-serve. Um, gone are the days, or at least should be for your teams, where data scientists walk across the hall and knock on the door for IT and say, I need a bigger machine. All this should be self-serve. And so this is really what we're putting in power at Oracle, is making sure that data science is self-serve, high compute access, you know, all the way from uh, small CPUs to big, you know, Tesla 100, like GPU-like machines from uh, NVIDIA, like, you know, we need to give power to data scientists. Now, IT needs to be able to control it. So that's another thing that's essential in the technology, is IT still needs to be able to control it, but data scientists need to have access to it, and also access to open source. So our, our biggest customers, some of the challenges they have is, you know, open source, there's just so much of it. You know, how do we manage it? Well, good technology and a good platform can help you manage it as well. And so it's, it's really, really key that, you know, we talked about team. It's not just team, it's also the right tools, the right technology that we give our data scientists in order for them to scale and provide value. Next part, um, technique. So a process for delivering reliable outputs to drive the business. A um, couple of key things on here that I would point out is standards and governance. So documenting the development process, building a center of excellence, even of information is key. How do we do and how do we tackle a particular product or a problem, I should say. Um, and also tied in, one could say technique or even technology is uh, version control. So all the best practices on engineering, data scientists have to use. I am shocked by how many data science teams are not doing version control. They're not using GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. All of these need to be inherent within the technology, but also part of the technique or the process. They need to be taught and they need to be part of the workflow. Because if you aren't doing version control, you know, and everybody in this room I'm sure does, what's gonna happen when that data scientist leaves? Everything is stuck on this local machine and if I told you the tenure was less than 11 months, that's crazy. So if we were to, to back up team, technology, and technique, these are three key areas to do a self-assessment on for your company to say, where are our gaps? What's our hole? Where do we need to invest in more? But if you're not achieving success in all three of these, you will not achieve success in doing good data science. So data science success, four things here is align on a centralized versus decentralized team. How do our teams operate? We just need to know that. Um, we need to align on the tools and the methodology that our data scientists are gonna use in projects. We need to align on version control and a productive workflow between data scientists and IT. And we need to promote model reuse by creating insights and model tag schemas. Work needs to get into production. Okay, um, I'm gonna go over some, some use cases. Um, this is some of the, the, the fun stuff. So, uh, finance, I, I came from finance before I started datascience.com. Um, finance, we are, we're great at fraud detection. You know, I came from American Express. American Express is amazing at fraud detection. I carry two cards in my pocket right now. But what people don't know is that the use cases clearly expand beyond that. So, we're seeing in finance a lot of virtual assistants. Um, we're seeing NLP on data, so usually natural language processing on massive amounts of, of text data to extract insights. Telecom, telecom's a really interesting space for use cases. Um, and that could be around optimizing network operations. So analyzing the network use in real time, predicting network issues, anomaly detection. You know, these are key things that we're seeing in the, um, in the telecom space. Again, you see this uh, virtual assistant, um, Oracle has done a lot of investment in chatbots as well, so that's something you should check out. Manufacturing use cases. Um, we have a customer um, in, the, in the biotech side, and when they are making products on the manufacturing line, let's say uh, 
uh, needles, uh, matter of fact, they're going through and they're doing deep learning image detection on the assembly line, on the manufacturing line, to detect if there's any issues you know, within uh, the products going through the assembly line. And they're doing this at a very fast pace that they're able to pick out and say, uh-oh, do we have defective product you know, at that point? So product optimization, quality assurance, predictive management, and then healthcare. Um, I was with a, a large um, healthcare company actually today, and we were talking about these, these three things. So this was actually from that slide. Patient care, hospital performance, medical imaging, and di diagnostics, or actually diagnosis. So on the patient care side is, you know, a few things. We want to find the best treatment plans according to your data, you know, and also trying to figure out how do we improve the effectiveness of the care. Hospital performance, how do we optimize staff scheduling, reduce wait times, manage supplies and accounting? So not everything here was, you know, just on the lines of uh, better, let's say, medicine from the standpoint of treatment, but it's also operations, you know, aspects. And so there's a lot of use cases that transcend across multiple industries. So I'm going to leave it open for some, some questions, if we're OK, too. But um, so in, in closing remarks, and I went pretty fast through these slides to make sure we stay on time, but um, Oracle's a leader in, in data science. And when we look at data science, it's artificial intelligence, it's machine learning, it's deep learning. Um, we've got a lot of wonderful products that are out there. Um, we've got a labs group that's creating some amazing IP that we're going to be pulling into our products as well. So you're going to see more and more of Oracle as it relates to enterprise um, AI and really empowering companies in this uh, autonomous message around how they can leverage their data, exploit their data, uh, and be powered in, a, in an AI way. Um, when we started, I want to talk about, yes, data, it's gold. We all know that. Um, Data science requires data, and digital transformation, I would say, requires data scientists. Data scientists are the architects, if you will, or the engineers of digital transformation. However, if you don't have the right team to be able to consume that, it's going to go nowhere. I, I've seen it over and over again. I, actually, I'm at an event tomorrow. Um, I'm speaking to an audience of just under 2,000 data scientists at a big company down the street. I was a speaker at the same event last year, and I, I asked for some insights. And it is shocking the amount of people that will work on a project that never makes it into production. Now, it's a, it's a finished product. It's a product where they really built a model in R or Python, but it's actually not being used by the lines of business. So what are some of the, the challenges there? So that's a team thing. The technology thing, just to kind of rehash this, is data scientists might write models in code like R, Python, Scala. Here's the challenge, and many of you sit on this side of the fence. Applications are written in Java. Applications might not be written and are not written in R. And so what happens here? So typically if a model is created in R, a data scientist has to give it to an engineering group who gets it onto the product roadmap, who then gets it translated, some things get lost and translated, and eventually it gets deployed. Well, okay. Now the data scientist doesn't have any control, might not even have as much view you know, into that model and the performance of that. So they built this and then just walked away. And so there are ways with, with technology, and I'm not saying this is for every single model that's out there you should do this, but you can wrap them, you can put it by an API endpoint, and make it consumable you know, by applications. So teamwork, technology, and technique on technique. Um, it's get a process that ties in workflow and collaboration get a process that follows best engineering practices, these things are critical. And if data science is done right, um, it's worth $3.5 trillion in derived value. So this is, this is hype, yes, from a standpoint of we haven't reached the full potential yet, but this is not going away. I sit down every day, probably with two, two to three of the biggest companies in the world, Monday through Friday. Every single one of them are investing in data science. Every single one of them are talking about digital transformation. But I'll tell you right now, all of them are facing challenges on not only how do you create the models, but how do you use the models. And so even though you're not data scientists here in the room, what I would ask is if your company is trying to exploit value from the data that you have, be in those conversations 
make sure they're cross-functional, help push those forward, focus on the team. And so there's a lot of value that you can drive within your companies. Cool. Um, I'll pause there, and I could probably take uh, maybe 10 minutes of, of questions. Cool. Question in the back, and I will repeat them. OK. So the, the question is, um, how can we get AI to scale in the local government side if you're not New York you know, and you're a smaller um, city or county, you know, if you will? Um, so one, uh, AI, deep learning, machine learning, it needs data, right? In, in some cases, it needs data at scale. Um, the nice thing is, from a government perspective, my, my friend DJ was actually working on this, you can go to data.gov and there's a lot of really cool data sources that are out there and more government entities are starting to share data with their peers. And so I'm not saying that we can see all that, but they're starting to inter, I don't say interagency, but intergovernment starts to share that. Um, the, the short of it is, I would say, leverage data at scale where you can outside of your local. But in terms of utilizing AI within it, um, I think the same business models apply and the same insights could apply. The, the weight of your features might differ, but the use case could be the same. And so we might be able to approach a model in a rather similar way in New York, just like how we would in LA, but also how we would in my small town in Manhattan Beach. Just the features of the model might be weighted differently. So I think the approach might be the same. And it's one way I would say to join Datakind is a good one. But there's a lot of the natural, um, the NSF, the National Science um, Foundation, is doing a lot of great work at the local government side. And there are chapters um, in the Pacific Northwest. There's a chapter down here. There's chapters all over the US. And it's some place to be able to go to for more resources. And that's the NSF. Other questions? One up front, and I'll repeat. The question is, what's the mechanism for change? If I'm saying that um, data science or digital transformation is hitting a roadblock where we're not actually using the models that are being produced, the change is really just a mindset. And it's, and it's approach to be able to say, how do we consume these, these outputs that the data science team are creating and put them in as inputs from an application layer perspective? On a technology side, it can be solved. Like I said, we can create APIs out of the models. But at the most point, where I see within companies is it's being created by a data science team and the lines of business are sitting around as in orbit and are not understanding maybe the business case, so there's not communication back and forth, nor are they understanding how they can potentially use the model. And I, and I don't think it's a technology problem. It's definitely not now. We have a product that solves that. Um, it's more of a mindset. Autonomous is, is a term that we're using across um, many aspects of the Oracle stack. So from a data warehouse perspective, um, but it's also, we're starting to leverage that in a data science perspective, you know, like my tool. So a couple things on that. Um, the question is, how are we different, how are we similar to other products that are in the market? Yeah. H2O, um, Google has stuff in auto machine learning. There's a few companies that are out there um, in a couple different ways. One is, you can use uh, H2O, um, Auto Scikit Learn, other solutions, open source solutions within the Oracle product. So you can use those and consume those within Oracle, not saying the Google one, um, but open source, auto machine learning techniques, libraries, frameworks, you can use that within the Oracle product. The difference with our product is we put it on a workbench that wraps it in entire workflow and project management. It's for teams of data scientists to work together. And once you create that model, we make it really easy for you to be able to deploy that model behind a REST API. And so now it can be consumed throughout the rest of the business and in other applications. Good, thank you. Any other questions? No. So, so the question is, um, you know, changing the mindset, like marketing has been trying to do that for a long time. Uh, how does data science effectively do this? The nice thing about data science is we can actually tell real numbers, you know, uh, and numbers that get to be precise on holdouts and training sets. And so we can say, if we change and we act in this way, here's the result you know, that we think that we can achieve. We're going to try to put a dollar value to it. The other nice part is um, we like to start small and do simple projects. So I'm going to do a quick, I'll do a quick whiteboard on this. So this will take one minute. Um, we worked with, and this will be interesting for the e-commerce company that was in the room. Um, we worked with the e-commerce company. It was one that sells many items. So they actually had three million 
unique SKUs on their site. And what they were trying to figure out was what makes an item sell. And uh, oh, my bad writing up here. And the items that this site had um, were unique items from the standpoint of these are items that you have in your closet. And so this is one of those like reseller sites. So it's a website that can take the clothes in your closet and list them you know, to, be, to be sold online. Now, knowing whether or not an item's gonna sell, if you give it a, what they defined a sellability score, so this item is a 90% chance of selling to this audience versus a 70% chance, because you have three million unique items, you need to know the score to be able to build recommendation engines. So what items you put on that first page, what items you email people. So we built this, this model, and these are the features of the model that have the most importance or the most weight in the model. So let me ask the question, what do you think makes an item sell? Like if I had a, uh, this jacket, just someone's got, what's that? Recommendation. Well, let's back up that, like the jacket in particular, like the price, right? Is this an expensive jacket? Is it a not expensive jacket? What's the brand of the jacket? Is it summertime or is it wintertime? Um, what's the color you know, of the jacket? Like these were all the features you know, the model, the, the brand, um, you know, the season, and the list can go on and on and on. The second item was the most interesting on here. The second item was actually the description of the item. The description? That seems kind of weird. Like higher than the brand, higher than like the color. The only thing that was higher was the price of whether or not an item sells. Why was the description so high? Well, what was interesting with this company is we built them this model, and this model, their team was able to go like, oh, it's really important, and it's great now that we know how likely something is gonna sell this jacket. But we're really questioning the results here on description. Why is it so high? And so what we did is we did another project. So first project, a simple project, just score items. The second project, by looking through the data, the features of the model, we found a new pocket of gold, descriptions. So we analyzed them using natural language processing and topic modeling, and what we found was descriptions that were more emotional versus descriptions that just gave you the facts, the emotional ones sold. Makes sense, right? So when they were selling, let's say, um, women's shoes, heels, they're saying these Louboutins that are black size seven versus these Louboutins that you can dance all night and they're perfect for that, that night out with your husband like on a Friday, you know, you're gonna feel great, <laughs> those ones sold. They can be the exact same products. And so what can you do from that? You can now build a model that can train your customers to write better descriptions. And in writing better descriptions, the revenue shot up percentage points. And that was the real gold. It was important for us to understand why an item sold to make a recommendation engine, but in working with the team, the team had domain knowledge, data scientists didn't, the team that had domain knowledge goes, descriptions, that seems odd, and then they helped us dig deeper and find the real gold. And so that's why I say it's a team sport, and that's where it gets exciting in working with the marketing teams, all the other functions is when you involve them in the beginning of, of the project, you know, and leverage the domain knowledge around the table, you can find some really unique insights. And at that point, put them to action, like how we did with this customer, and teach their, right, their consumers to write better descriptions. At the end of the day, many percentage points in, in new revenue for them, which was great. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Uh, really, oh, one, one last question. Yeah. Despite um, where we're at in technologies like self-driving cars and other areas, which I think we're really getting to the point of Uber advancement, right, where we're gonna start seeing um, you know, long, uh, long distance trucking you know, taken over by uh, automated uh, driving and, and autonomous vehicles, a lot of the business practices that we're talking about in this, I think it's gonna take a while. I think it's gonna take five or 10 years, I mean, to, to be perfectly honest. Um, I don't think this is happening overnight. I think the technologies are there. I think the data scientists are now trained. You know, they're, they're ramping up their skills to be able to leverage the technology. Now it's gonna be up to the other parts of the business to, to shift, to bend, and to consume. And they're not used to working with engineers. They're not used to working with data scientists. They're not typically product people you know, in all aspects. And I think that mind shift um, has to take place, but also a cross-pollination where um, we're not gonna see divided lines of business, but more interconnected lines of business across functions.
But I think it's going to take five to 10 years. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. My name is Rama Kiraju. I am a distinguished engineer and uh, a director at the IBM Watson division. Uh, today, I thought I would tell you about some of the best practices in building machine learning models. And these best practices are something that uh, really came to us while we were building a bunch of uh, AI services for Watson. And if you're not familiar with Watson and what these AI services are, um, they are the building block services for building any kind of AI application. So these are things like speech to text, natural language understanding services such as understanding entities in a given document, understanding sentiment, relationships in a given document in text, and recognizing images in a given uh, visual Im image picture and so on. So these are really the fun foundational uh, building blocks of building any AI application. So we build those and make them available on IBM's Watson platform. And as part of building those and as part of enabling various those services in various languages, we discovered and learned many interesting things along the way. So I, I thought I would summarize those um, today in the talk. Some of you may have seen this picture, but I'll let you read it. So this, the, the current state of data science um, is really something like this, right? Where you throw in a whole bunch of data into a pile try a different bunch of algorithms and see if the predictions make sense to you. If they don't make sense to you, just keep starting until the predictions make sense to you. Because some of these algorithms, what goes inside is, is not all that obvious, especially if you use deep learning algorithms. Anyway, that's just something fun to get started. Um, so I want to talk about what are the kind of AI applications that clients are building in the marketplace. Ian had a very good set of use cases. He already walked through all of these. so. Um, I don't have to spend a lot of time taking you through this. But if you look at um, where customers are building business solutions using AI, they tend to be around these chatbots, right? Where in customer service type of domains, customers are calling into a call center and the calls get automatically routed or, or um, they get uh, transcribed and uh, specific solution or specific response that need to be given to an agent uh, is done by automated chatbot agents or Agents as agent assists where agents get help from these AI applications in finding the, the right solution quickly from a large database and knowledge base of things. Uh, or in medical domains, right, where we are building doctor's assistants in um, uh, finding anomalies in radiology uh, reports or uh, uh, finding the best treatment for a given patient based on the best practices that were derived from um, uh, the, the routines or whatever the previous doctor has applied. So these are all things that are being documented in natural language and uh, or in medical journals. Large amounts of uh, uh, medical journals and articles are being published every day. Understanding which treatments is, are best working for what kinds of diseases is something that best and best experts uh, are figuring out, uh, you know, well-trained doctors in, uh, in uh, uh, different parts of the world. But how can that information be really made accessible to doctors in remote parts of the world so that they, they still get the benefit of understanding what are the, the best practices, what treatments are working for patients? Um, and so these are some of the examples. And in legal domain, uh, as assistants for attorneys, um, you know, these legal laws, rules are so complicated, so you can unleash an AI system on it to try and understand what are the various laws and which one can be applied at what point in time and help attorneys prepare for a case, for example. Or in social media monitoring, right, where um, you want to know who is saying what uh, about which product and um, uh, what are the sentiments that they're expressing, what kind of attitudes do they have about what kind of products and why, um, and understand that to do better marketing or to build better products. And also in Face, de face detection type of technology is being used widely in um, security domain. You, you, you're starting to see increasingly these type of things in uh, airports and, and other domains. So these are the kind of applications that customers are building. But as AI companies, what these big vendors like IBM, Microsoft, Google, Oracle, everybody is offering are these building block services. And these are very much needed to build those higher order set of AI applications, right? So what are these type of things? When somebody speaks naturally into an AI system, you need to be able to understand and transcribe that, that speech to text. And in order for that AI system to come back and respond to the, to, to the human being, 
uh, you need something like text to speech to translate whatever the system came up with the answer or response and be able to translate that using text in, into text to speech. And when the actual speech came out, there is some intent, some kind of a, uh, a question or something that the user has expressed. And, and that needs to be understood by the AI system. right? So that's part of understanding natural language. So what that means is it includes understanding the intent, understanding the entities, what, is, what are the, the, the various things that are being spoken, and what is the sentiment about, about these various kinds of things. What is the relationships that are being talked about in this? So these are all basic natural language understanding type of services. Many vendors offer these. And then there is a whole set of services that help you understand who is the person who is talking. Right? You want to be able to customize these uh, pro AI, so AI products to the customers who are actually using them. So you want to be able to better understand who the person is from their personality perspective, from their sentiment, from their emotions, from the communication tones that they are using to talk about the uh, whatever question they are using or the complaint that they are having and so on. So there are a, a suite of these AI models that are built in that space. Um, and then, of course, natural language tran translation. Um, not everything in the world comes in, in English or you know, one or two languages, right? The, uh, you know, multicultural world where people speak many languages. People are interacting with these AI systems naturally in different languages. So these AI services have to be able to really understand all these languages. And it's such an interesting problem in AI. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later on, um, to train AI in different languages. But language translation service is another important foundational one. Then conversation. How do you enable a more natural conversation between a human and a, um, and a computer? In order to do that, you have to encompass or encapsulate some kind of a dialogue capability. How, does, how do humans interact? What are the standard type of speech patterns that are typically used when humans communicate? Can we codify them into rules, or can we codify them into some kind of uh, um, a set of flows that can naturally guide an, art, an AI system to have a, a meaningful and a natural conversation with a human being. And then to be able to understand images, right, uh, uh, and identify objects that are in the images. And uh, discovery being where you have large amounts of documents, either enterprise documents or uh, public documents, being able to understand what are the various things being talked about in those, all those documents, what are the various relations, and what, what is happening, what are the patterns in this, and, and discover new insights from it. So say these are sort of more building blocks. But I, what customers are actually building are these, right? So if we just offer these building blocks and say, hey, customers, go ahead and go build out your AI applications, how do they go about doing that? Right now, kind of that's where we are. And customers are having to really figure out how to go from taking this speech to text, text to speech, natural language understanding type of services, and build this bridge to build these applications that they want. So what I want to talk about is what does it take to actually build that bridge to, to build the actual kind of applications? So there are some very introductory type of information. Initially, later on, I have, um, I'll take, because I cannot cover all aspects of AI pipeline, I, I took one aspect of AI pipeline, the error analysis, which is very little talked about. And I'll go into more detail about that later on. But I want to make sure everybody is with me. So uh, bear with me if this is you know, bread and butter to you. But um, so AI services can be taught to make predictions, right, with data and examples. And typically, Many AI services, not all, are machine learned. Some are rule based, but let's go with the, the fact that they're right now machine learned services. And everybody talks about data being the fuel, algorithm being the engine. And uh, in fact, uh, the famous professor Andrew Ng says that AI is the new electricity. And I would like to tag on to that to say speech is what is speech is the switch to turn it on. Um, that's the natural language modality. But generally speaking, you give a bunch of it's, it's more sort of supervised type of learning that majority of the problems fall into this category where you give cats and dogs images. This is the, the more the very famous cats and dogs type of problems um, solving. But you give them labeled data, right? And uh, you train a system. And at the end of it, it graduates and it says, hey, I can now make predictions, right? Roughly, this is, there is, of course, the whole world of unsupervised machine learning. But, um, Majority of the problems solved in the supervised machine learning, so I'll stick to that. Ian also had similar kind of chart, so I won't spend too much time, but this is a very, this got many layers to it as we peel. So this is what goes into building an AI pipeline. This is a, um, a very iterative process. And there are many differences from building an AI model to building a traditional software application. And I want to kind of highlight some of those things as I go through the talk. So the first step in building an AI model, actually, I correct myself 
although this is a more traditional one, there are many steps before the data collection, and I'll get to that in just a bit, but data collection and preparation. Right, you collect data, then you prepare features, you train a model, you test it, verify that it works, uh, benchmark it, deploy it, and continuously learn from it. At a high level, that, those are the steps. But when you start peeling the onion, data collection and preparation involves so many complicated um, steps, and I'll take you through how we need AI to actually collect data for AI. There is humongous amount of uh, uh, complexity in dealing and managing with data and preparing data for AI. So data comes from many in formats, from many sources, places, so you crawl, you acquire, you purchase, whatever. You clean it, you enrich it, annotate it. And the annotation process is the process where you actually say that this is a cat, an image of a cat, this is an image uh, of a dog, right? Uh, or this sentence is a, is a positive sentiment sentence, and this sentence is a negative sentiment sentence. So that's the kind of annotation. And how do you do that? We have to, humans have to do that because humans know this process the most. So it's a very laborious annotation process, right? And I'll talk about how crowd workers play a significant role as, the, as part of building an AI model, right? And then you store the data. Very important to keep lineage of this data to, to know, you know what data, how much data you added into building a particular model and um, uh, how did the model do and how exactly, what, what do you need to do further to improve the model. And then you analyze all that data, so that's the responsibility of a data lead. And crowd workers play a significant role in, as an extended team in preparing data in AI. In feature preparation, there are many steps, depending on the kind of service that you're preparing, whether it's a text service or a speech service, there are many kind of features that need to be prepared. You have to tokenize the text, you have to segment it, you have to prepare the parts of speech that are on it and lemmatize it if you need to be, prepare it for, with syntactic parsers, and if it is in the case of speech, phonetic dictionaries have to be created, normalize all the data. Um, so a lot of steps that need to go in, and typically a training lead is the person who does that and prepares the, the features and the data. Then there is uh, the model training part. Here is a, a data scientist um, uh, typically is going through the, the process of uh, designing the architecture. What type of algorithm makes sense? Is it a deep learning algorithm? Do I require a, uh, SVM? What makes most sense? Logistic regression, Ch design the architecture and the choice of the algorithm and prepare all the ground truth with all the rules and everything. Train it, train multiple models along the way, right? Um, because you don't know which parameters will work out well and um, uh, and there is always, always edge case handling, some, the long tail part of uh, things that need to be handled separately, and fine tune all the parameters, and iteratively, again, after training many, many models, you arrive at a particular model that you want to release to the market because it seems to work well on a particular set of test data set that you really care to optimize for the market. And then there is a service development and packaging lead who comes and takes all this. Ian was also talking a lot about this as to how data scientists write in R and Python, and when you actually have to deploy it, you need to make all kinds of decisions on, are you gonna deploy that Python model, or do you have to you know, re-implement it in a different language, and what are the runtime uh, optimization parameters, you know, what should be the response time of a particular service. You have, all these considerations have to be taken into account, that's what the service development and packaging team leads do. And, um, and, and there is a whole test team um, that uh, tests all these models, right? Are they making the right predictions? Is it making sense the, uh, as against the gold truth that you have collected? Um, is this sentiment prediction right? Uh, and here again, crowd workers play a significant role. Um, you can use crowd workers as extended testing and quality assurance team these days. Of course, that again, there's a whole data science behind managing crowds and the quality of the annotations and quality of work that crowds will give you in, uh, um, in building AI models, and we can go into that. That's a whole different topic and talk in itself. Um, so testing and benchmarking itself is, is, is very iterative. You test your, your model, and if there is comp competitors out there, you want to test against their models as well to make sure that you are in the ballpark and are you competitive or not. Um, and often, it's always a good idea to, again, do the user perception testing. Although you have ground truth that's been prepared by users, you never know once the model is learned against that ground truth if you really want to you know, just take it, take it to the users and say, uh, what do you think about this, this model and the predictions of the model and see what, how they perceive it and compute the metrics associated with the user perception. And um, keep model provenance, right? You built one model today, but it's not gonna be the ultimate model that will stick in the marketplace. As with any software, there'll be multiple versions you'll be building. So what was the 
the, the accuracy metric on the previous model. What is the new accuracy metric that I'm releasing to the market? Always keep tabs of that and keep the provenance of the model. So at a high level, this is what, is, uh, um, is what goes into building an AI model. But I kind of lied when I said it's the process starts at data collection and preparation, but it actually doesn't. This is how the whole data science community went about for a long time thinking that this is the AI model you know, life cycle. But it actually has many more steps that are totally missed. And that's, we discovered it the, the hard way after working at it for a while. So actually, it has to start at uh, understanding what is the business case for building this AI model. right? Whose problem is it solving? What's its existential purpose? What kind of, and does it make business sense to build an AI model here or not? Um, because a lot of times, the cost dynamics may or may not make sense. Um, it, it costs a lot of money to build an AI model because data is very expensive, depending on the type of model that you're building. And, um, and, and depending on how much you are pricing it, your AI model out in the market, uh, some of the cost economics may not make sense. And uh, you don't want to regret halfway through that, oh my god, it costs so much to build it, and it only costs, uh, we have to only charge our customers a penny uh, for this service. It's just not working out. You never want to have that kind of regret. So establish a business case and understand how many languages this AI model need to work in. Is it, it's, 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 it's nice and fine to build a prototype by collecting a bunch of data that you get from uh, your enterprise in one language. But if, as with any company these days, you're very multicultural and you probably want your AI model to work in different languages, right? So the moment you start expanding it from English to German, Japanese, French, Spanish, Italian, and all that, it, the costs blow up because you have to collect data in all these languages and now make it work. And so it's very important to establish that business case. Define performance targets. In the world of AI, uh, it's, it's very different from traditional software. In a traditional software, Requirements are given, you build a model for that requirements, and it's always deterministic, right? It, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. But uh, an AI model is only, uh, it's, it's probabilistic. It, it makes predictions, but it could get it wrong a lot of times. So there are different set of metrics, right? You measure precision, recall, F1 measures, or word error rate if it is speech, or character error rate if it is a, um, Asian language, and so on. So these metrics, you need to know what is an acceptable metric, because 100% is not achievable. So is 80% OK as the base model? And then how do you improve it on top? Is, are you, if your expectations are at 95% on your first iteration of the model, it's unlikely that you will get to that. Uh, and I'll say unlikely because it takes a lot of data to get to that level of accuracy. So if you're willing to spend that much, that's fine. That's why it's important to set the performance targets and define and based on the business case and say, well, if I'm going to get this much money, this much data, then this is how much I can get accuracy. Is that acceptable? If not, you have to kind of iterate on the business case. Then procure funds for the data acquisition. And the data that comes from different vendors and data that comes from public data sources tends to be very noisy. And uh, data that you get annotated from crowd workers also tends to be very noisy unless you manage that whole process for quality control. So if you, if you take all this noisy data and feed it into an AI model, you'll get a pretty you know, bad uh, prediction model, right? So it's not worth it. So there has to be a very good quality control process. And you need a lot of AI to institute these quality control processes. Interestingly, it's a very circular thing. So I'll, I'll, let me give you one example. When we, get, when we get, get a lot of audio files to train our speech to text model, we get a lot of noisy audio files. It, they have got a lot of uh, background noise where people, children are playing in the background. There is a train going in the background. Um, and sometimes there are a lot of uh, silences in it. And, uh, and that's real world data, and they sell it. But if we, and, and to some extent, that good data, that kind of data is also good data because the model needs to understand and to tune out in some places and to really know when the actual speech is being spoken to take and train a model. But um, you don't want all your entire data set to be so noisy, right? Um, so we have to have a lot of tools for computing the signal to noise ratio, for computing the silences, for computing the audio quality metrics and, and so on, so that we can screen all these input data sets that we get so that what we, what we get is as a good distribution of what we actually want. So what we actually want might be that I want you know, 30% of very high quality data, 
30% of a little bit of noisy data, 30% of data with gender distribution taken into account, 30%, uh, I'm not adding it up to 100, but certain percentage to um, have uh, enough accent representation and certain percentage to have enough noises where there are the street background, uh, train background, children playing background. So you have to take all those things into account and you need a lot of AI system, uh, metrics to manage the data process. Data requirements, this is um, test cases. You build the traditional good practice software development is, uh, good software development practices tell you that always start with writing unit tests, right? Write your test cases first and then build your system and make sure that you, your unit tests and system tests work. So somehow along the way, when we move to data science and AI, we kind of left some of the good best practices that we know from software field and just jumped into building an AI model. I, I rarely see a company where test cases drive the actual development of an AI model. And now we are making it a practice in, a, in, a, in an IBM that you have to, the offering manager who really wants to take an AI model to the product has to first define a test case and tell me, so that kind of covers the whole area for me. Tell me what all things this model is supposed to do well on. So that test case should tell me whether it should have African-American women prediction right, it should get uh, enough gender right, it should get enough accents right, it should get enough uh, um, you know, age groups right. You better define what the, what the AI model should do. If you don't define it, it'll do whatever it, the data it, it has got access to and it'll do something. But uh, suddenly when, you know, when, it is, when a use case comes along and somebody tests it on what it's supposed to work on, you realize that it's not doing it and you start blaming the data science team, but uh, data science team was never given any goal, so how would they know whether they have achieved, how would you as an offering manager or a product manager know whether you have achieved it or not? So I'm kind of jumping into some of my, the best practices that I'm going to cover already, but um, uh, so there are a lot of these things, and um, there are many vendors out there that will give you data to build many of these things, and you have to kind of really build that ecosystem of uh, uh, partnerships with those data providing vendors. So this is very much like a car manufacturing analogy. If you want to build a car, right, you have to build that ecosystem of car parts suppliers right around you so that they arrive just in time and with just you can produce cars with just in time manufacturing where you don't hold inventory carrying costs and all that. Same thing applies for data. I mean, may not be so much for data inventory uh, carrying costs, but there are lead times to getting data in AI. I mean, if you're, and I, and I have to say what perspective I'm bringing to the table here. The perspective I'm bringing is uh, that of a, a company that's building AI models to sell in the marketplace. Now, if you're a company who are on the receiving end of this, say, speech to text, natural language understanding services, and you're trying to build on top of those an AI application, I'll get to your perspective in just a bit. But as a company who is building these things, you have to have this vendor ecosystem built so that it takes three months to get some, some aspects of data. So you cannot plan your you know, release for a speech to text system um, next month if data is gonna take three months. So this, this is very important. It's exactly like estimate the lead times in getting data to build these models. And interestingly enough, none of these things are spoken in, in, in machine learning AI community. You know where, and I, don't, I won't cover the rest of them because this is where the rest of the AI community focuses on. And in fact, 80% of the community talks about model training. It is so exciting to talk about algorithms, right? And we all like to do that, but um, uh, a lot of time and effort gets spent on other things. So I'm, get, I'm getting to my best practices here. So manage the data pipeline thoughtfully and consciously. Data is the differentiator in AI business. Those that have high quality labeled data are the ones who will win in this business. So data is the elephant in the room. And it's, uh, Ian Swanson spoke about it as well. But the kind of things that I want to focus on are, you know, I mentioned some of these already. You have to have a very good um, handle on where the data is coming from and who are the vendors who is supplying it. Whether you have, you know, the license to actually do anything with that data because Companies, insurance companies get audited all the time. If a loan processing application AI model is making predictions or is making recommendations on who, to be, who, who the loan should be, should be given to, and let's say it's, it's, it's uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, somebody filed a lawsuit that it's discriminating you know, people in certain 
um, uh, geographic area or people of certain age groups or people of certain race, you will get audited. So you need to be able to show what, are, what is all the data that your model is trained on. And uh, you know, if, you, if you don't have a good practice of actually holding that data, managing the lineage of it, what are the licensing terms associated with that data, whether you um, have, who is the vendor who supplied it, and how did you manage the distribution, then you are in trouble. So in, in, in some of these businesses, actually, it's, it's so critical to maintain data lineage and uh, understand the legality of data. And also the coverage for fairness, right? And this goes back to my testing comment. Um, in, again, in, go, in the loan approval case, did you train the system? What, what features did you train the system with? Did you include age, gender, and those things as a feature? Is it really needed or not? I mean, these are very conscious decisions you have to make when you're building these kind of systems. Otherwise, you could very well end up building a system that's biased, and uh, you would get sued. So all these questions, these are so pertinent to building an AI model that you have to ask yourself. And also, how much does it cost? Does the business case make sense? What domains, use cases, accents, age groups, and industries is the data in? So I know if, if, I, have, if I have collected a lot of data in an insurance domain and uh, built a model, because that, that's where I got a lot of free data from, and I take that model and take it to a retail application and expect it to do well, it's not going to do well because it, it has been trained on insurance domain, right? It understands that vocabulary of, uh, uh, of insurance and uh, uh, loans and, and those types of things. It may not understand you know, user preferences and uh, the color, shape, uh, um, you know, and those kind of things in a retail domain. So you have to know the distribution. How is the data? What is the data that you are training the model on? And you have to consciously manage it to meet the goal. What is the purpose of this AI model? What should it actually do in the marketplace? And therefore, the data has to be collected cor corresponding to that. Um, yeah, I talked about the lineage and so on. Yeah, data is the new oil, but oil ain't cheap, right? So here is some um, uh, it's public data, speech to text engine typically needs 10,000 hours of data to be you know, anywhere good and competitive in one language. And, uh, and there are two kind of bands in speech, if you will, which is uh, uh, 16 kilohertz what's, kilohertz, what's called a broadband, and 8 kilohertz, what's called a narrowband. And um, it costs anywhere from 5 million to 17 million between broadband and narrowband. And if you, if you want to build it in 10 languages, a speech-to-text system, you're talking about 220 million. So you have to have a business case whether, and the speech services cost a penny. So um, does it make sense? Does, you know, should I be, a natural language understanding services are somewhat um, not as expensive, but you know, pretty expensive. So that's why I say you know, business case has to make sense. And on the data point, the data, data pipeline is underappreciated. You know, I, I've, uh, I think uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, repeating this point over and over again, but it is, it is so important because it's so less talked about, right? So data collection, data selection, annotation, as in the labeling process and enriching that data and checking the quality of the data requires a lot of AI. You need to apply many AI algorithms to prepare data for AI, right? So data comes in the crawling and checking to make sure the different uh, distributions of data you're collecting and uh, what kinds of sampling techniques that you bring to the bear, statistical techniques you bring to the bear to collect different aspects of data that is needed to train it. And there is a whole data science in human-computer interaction field for setting proper guidelines for annotating data. So how do you make sure that when crowd workers are given a task, you give them a sentence and say, hey, I like the service uh, in this restaurant, uh, but uh, the food taste could be better, right? So it's a mixed sentiment thing. Uh, or maybe sometimes they say, well, you know, this is so cool. And in, in uh, colloquial language, cool means good or bad. It depends on the context, right? So you give it to crowd workers, you get responses all over the place. Some say it's positive, some say it's a neutral sta sentiment uh, statement, some say it's a um, uh, positive one. Some are obvious where some people are just kind of clicking the first one every time because they just want to make a quick buck and move on. Uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that you, you resolve these conflicts? Or how do you train a model with this kind of data? And uh, how do you ensure that crowd workers are not randomly clicking and, and you, you know, you, we, we give them a different, different uh, kinds of um, 
um, attention checking type of questions and and you do interrater agreement by you know asking multiple crowd workers to rate and uh, and take a, um, use different kinds of criteria you know take an average or take anything that's above certain thing or when the interrater agreement happens so there are many techniques for annotating it and there is a whole science behind this uh, enhancement often the data that you get is not enough you have to augment it so we use, a diff we use different kinds of data synthesis type of techniques. So for example, we overlay a lot of um, noise tracks on top of uh, regular speech. And for those of you who are building these speech models and such, this is all you know, standard practice. It's really not all that much new. But um, uh, the idea is that the general pipeline holds, not just for speech, not just for any kind of uh, uh, any AI model, uh, I mean, uh, for any kind of an AI model, even in a text-based one, you can take a, f a sentence and paraphrase it. If you want to generate different variations of it and teach it, uh, teach the model different uh, ways in which a sentence could be said, uh, you could make a direct, um, uh, take a sentence and make it indirect, or uh, you could add synonyms to it and, and change the variations of it and so on. So data synthesis is a whole field again in itself, different kinds of algorithms can be applied. Basically, you augment and enrich the data that you have because you cannot spend enough money to collect all the data you want. And then uh, the quality checking, as I said, there are many manual, uh, human in the loop type of processes as well as automated tools that you need in order to check the quality of the, the data that you collect. Okay, so second best practice. Accelerate learning by scoping the problem. So what happens um, it typically when you do experiments in uh, building an any, mo any model is that you plot, these are called learning curves, you plot as the training data size increases, the, typically you would expect the accuracy of the model to increase. So, and that's this curve. What happens is that, you know, as it gets expensive, uh, more and more expensive to collect more and more data. So what do you do? This is the learning curve that, you, if you want to be good at everything, this is the learning curve. And that's what we call as base model. But you may not need to be good at everything. If you're a customer who is in a specific industry, in insurance industry, maybe somewhat of a decent base is okay, and then you build on top of it with, by narrowing the domain and say, now I expect this model to work only in this industry. So what happens then is, you may kind of train the model with medium amount of data, so you're over here, um, but you want to get to here, how do you do that? So you narrow the scope of the problem and the domain of the problem. Now you start to write a different learning curve. Now when you take it to a particular customer, a customer may say, hmm, I don't really care if it works for the entire industry problem, I only care about this use case, right? So I only want the system to be good at this use case and these words. So you kind of train the system on those words. Now you start to learn a different learning curve. So instead of going here, uh, and trying to get this kind of thing, you can get to higher accuracies with smaller and smaller amounts of data. And when you, when you want to optimize it further for a user, you know, you'll, you'll write it, another one, because how exactly does this user speak to an AI system? Just collect that data and feed it in. And so you're kind of narrowing the problem. The, the point is that if you try to be good at everything, you have to collect you know, large amounts of data, and that may not be um, what you actually, well, in an ideal world, that's what we want to be, uh, the AI system to be, but that's, we're not in an ideal world yet. We, we don't have enough uh, state-of-the-art techniques to, to get, help us get there. So if you, uh, if you have um, heard about this recent announcements, uh, maybe a couple of months ago from um, Google, uh, where they demonstrated an automated uh, AI system that would make reservations for you in a you know, hair salon, or uh, at a restaurant, why do you think they have demonstrated only those two use cases? And not, a gen not invited somebody from the audience and say have a general conversation with this system, right? Because it's too hard. If you narrow it to restaurant reservations, you've narrowed the problem down. There are only certain number of phrases or you know, variations that can occur, so you can train an AI system for those and keep the domain controlled and it'll have, it'll have a better chance of succeeding. 
Same thing for the hair appointment salon, right? So very targeted command and control type of things, and that's what that's the kind of AI that's getting into our day-to-day -day lives now. If you if you see uh, in cars where you you give very directed short phrases, and those phrases it understands. And if you start having a more broader general conversation, um, there are all kinds of funny things about people talking to Siri and people talking to Google Home. If you have directed type of questions, it does well. But if you start having a general conversation, then you know you run into all kinds of funny situations because you know they're not trained to really be good at everything. And that goes back goes back to this base model uh, because it's too hard a problem, right? Now, I said AI for the enterprise means narrow the domain. How do you narrow the domain? What does that mean? So here is a, a Mott gauge uh, template I just pulled off of the internet. And it has things like a landlord has the right to, landlord may impose rules, and a lot of complicated language. Tenant shall not assign. So the base model, when we build entity detection, what we will do is we build entities such as something that it can recognize a person, place, thing, location, organization, or a number. But when we take it to a domain, it needs to actually understand the actual industry-specific entities such as obligations and rights. Right? It needs to understand the structure around the obligations and rights so that it can help me parse this legal document. And on a given situation, I can ask this um, SA and AI system whether, whether the landlord had violated the agreement or the tenant had violated the agreement or what which law applies at this point we could ask the system of those types of questions if if we can train it to really recognize these types of um, entities right my general purpose entities that i have built may not may not work but at the same time i cannot go and build entities for insurance domain for retail domain that domain this domain one company cannot do that it becomes too much right so that's where customization comes in, where you say, hey, I have a base model that does a reasonably good job of identifying persons, places, and things, and those sort of things. Now, let's extend the notion of a person to a landlord. Let's extend the notion of a person to a tenant. And that, that tenant and landlord in the domain of legal domain has specific meanings, and they are, they are on the opposite sides of, uh, of the line. And uh, you know, there is a whole ontology behind what these entities actually mean, and that needs to be built and, uh, and maintained, and then this particular document can be parsed, understood by an AI system to answer useful queries for you. And that's one of the, uh, the things that um, I'm talking about when I say customize uh, the, the AI services. And here are a couple more examples. A speech-to-text system, depending on the context, could get confused between caller, caller, color. Or uh, these are more general purpose English confusions. It can be cleared up with some good training. But over the weekend, I was trying uh, Infosys to several of the speech engines, not only IBM's. And maybe my Indian accent could be contributing to it, but I expect it to understand my Indian English because you know that's part of uh, uh, the, I'm one part of the, the segment that it needs to understand. Emphasis, it, it, it uh, transcribed it as emphasis instead of Infosys. When I said AT&T, it said it's empty. You could go and try. By now, it may have learned, actually. <laughs> if it's a good system, it would have learned by now. For Sanofi, I, I particularly picked these ones because they're very uh, company name specific. You don't see them in more general purpose uh, speech data that you would get. You have to kind of go into an in, a company's uh, specific things. For Sonafi, it transcribed as sonography. When I said um, double three, double two, triple four, an interesting one, which people usually use in, in, in their natural uh, spoken text. For double three, maybe my three pronunciation and accent contributed to double three as, as letters, and then two, two, four, 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 that got it right. So these kind of things, when you, are, when you deploy a speech to text system in employee medical records identification, or in um, health data, um, uh, medical record identification, so that you know information can be pulled automate, automatically and so on. Um, these kind of problems need to be, you know, fixed. So that's part of customizing the speech-to-text system, either for language or for domain words, so that it gets better in that domain, right? And Typically, speech-to-text systems also get tripped up on these kind of uh, things. Some of them you know, are very popular. They get it right. But when I said AAAI, which is the Association for, American, uh, Association for Artific Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, uh, it, it, for whatever reason, it, said it transcribed it as chicken AI. <laughs> <laughs> 
So yeah, so you have to take these domain vocabulary and train it so that the system understands better. This is also an example that we run into often. Uh, so sentiment, um, in if you train a system with general data, pa the word ticket is associated with a parking ticket, and usually it's, it's mentioned in, in scenarios where people are kind of uh, you know, upset about the fact that they got a parking ticket or a traffic violation ticket. Uh, but in a customer support domain, problem ticket is what the actual conversation always starts with. So I take a sentiment system that's built with general purpose data from Twitter and uh, um, you know, uh, whatever conversations, blogs, and those types of things, and deploy that in a customer support domain. And the first thing it does for a problem ticket is says negative sentiment. But the, the candidate, the person, the caller is just saying, my problem ticket number is such and such, and I'm following up on it. Yes, it may be a complaint, but just the fact that you're supplying a problem ticket doesn't make it a negative sentiment statement. And that's because ticket is not necessarily a negative sentiment connotation word in a customer support domain, but it may be in a general purpose domain. So the system needs to be retaught some of these types of things, and that's one, another example of customization. And I, I kind of already talked about these domain-specific entities, the mortgage domain. You know, you, you need to understand these kind of words. So when you build a model, a natural language understanding model for entities and such, you want to next take it to the next level and say, you know, I need to un better understand the loans, intents, and all these words and what it means and the context around it, so I can parse these documents better and actually be able to answer queries in a meaningful manner. Okay, best practice three, and I should wrap up in the next few minutes, I think. Um, establish the purpose. I think I already talked about it, so I won't uh, belabor this point. Um, uh, people like to talk about 80% uh, of the discourse is about training and testing, but I already talked the, about the fact that this rest of the steps don't really get that much attention, and that's where 80% of the time and effort actually is spent in building AI models. Um, and here is where I want to call out two points, that you want to build your test cases first, and know what kind of data you brought to train the model and declare your biases. So before anybody could catch you and say, hey, your system doesn't do well, um, you better declare your own biases. So there was a, a New York Times article that came out uh, on image recognition software's um, you know, thing, and there was a huge uproar in, uh, um, in the general media because they like to hype things up a little bit more than what it deserves. Uh, that's what they did. And uh, what, what actually happened there was that um, these several image recognition uh, APIs that uh, these researchers who published a paper on happened to have tried didn't do a good job of recognizing African-American women's faces. And, uh, um, and it so happens that that happened because there was not enough African-American women's faces in the, the, the various data sources from which they collected all these different you know, APIs that were built, collected the data for, and therefore the representation of it was not there, and therefore it did a bad job of it. Now, if only, and this is a lesson learned afterward, actually, this, this idea, this best practice insight came to me after that and said, if only if, I had, if we had created a test case, and that test case actually had a representation of you know, all different races and genders and age groups and such, and say, hey, this is your goal. And if the goal, uh, is, not, if the goal is defined, when you actually test the model on those test cases, you, you would have caught it, right? Um, or you say that my, date, my model is trained on this type of data in these proportions. When you declare your, your data information that way, people know what they're getting. So you, at least you're being transparent with them, and they know that there is not enough representation of a certain kind, and therefore they need to augment that part of it in order for the model to do better or whatnot, right? So I would say, you know, it's, it's like this, nutrition labels. Several decades ago, there were no nutrition labels on food. But consumers now, over the years, have lobbied for it. And now, you know, when you pick up a, um, you know, whatever chewy bar, you know exactly how much sugar there is in it and how many carbohydrates and how much protein and whatnot, right? It's all there. And you make a conscious choice of whether you want to consume that chewy bar or not. Same thing with an AI model. If, you only, if only you, you kind of be, are transparent um, about what data it's trained on, you can decide whether that works for you or not. Um, okay, an AI model isn't going to be the perfect model that you want in the first iteration. It is going to have to iterate. So what is very critical is that um, having a very systematic, disciplined set of tools around diagnosing the mistakes and the errors that a model makes and 
very systematically prioritizing those mistakes and say, which is the one that's worth addressing because it's, it's a high severity kind of error, and which are the ones that um, I can live with because I don't have the bandwidth to address them all. So these kind of critical decisions have to be made. For that, there is, there is a whole practice around um, how do you do error analysis and how do you uh, uh, test the models? How do you actually update the, the tests and how do you iterate the models in order to do it? So you, know, you have to be able to first understand what is the, where, where the model is confused, that's the confusion metrics, and understand you know, the individual set of metrics and say what are the biases and what, what is the variance and, and proactively actually understand how to generate failed test cases for the model so that you can actually test the model and make sure that, that it works on that long tail of things, and how do you validate those er errors? Uh, again, you may need human in the loop. How do you categorize those errors as uh, you know, different kinds of severity? And how do you know um, what in the data that you have collected is going to help you when you put flow back in for training is going to actually help you to fix that error, right? You don't want to just throw any type of data in and say, hope for that error to be solved. That's too expensive. You have to be very consciously selecting data that is likely to fix that error and flow it in if your goal is to fix a particular high severity error. So again, there is a whole data science and AI for error modeling, error analysis, and all that that we need to bring to bear. OK, um, the last uh, best practice. I, I said that an AI model cannot, um, the first time around, is not going to uh, be the best it can be. So it needs to continuously improve. So what does that mean? And there are some neat tricks that you can do you know, as a com customer who deploys these AI applications. You can collect your data, the data that your customers are you know, calling your AI model with, if they opt in to let you use that data for improving it. You take that opt-in data get it annotated with humans, and plow it back and let the model learn. Right? And, and there may have to be a bunch of things that you have to do to process it to take out any kind of personally sensitive data, PII data, and those types of things. Plow it back and further improve the model. So that's the continuous learning loop of it. So I shared five best practices. There are many more. Um, I have some blog articles on my LinkedIn page. But uh, what uh, I'll kind of very quickly go through this. There are similarities and differences from traditional software development to AI development. Uh, if you look at um, where data is, traditionally uh, in, an, in a traditional software application, the data resides in an enterprise database. Where, whereas in building an AI model, it needs to be acquired, cleansed, annotated, uh, and the data may belong to your customer. And, uh, and you, there are lots of different licensing rules and uh, um, ownership rules that play into picture. And as we talked a lot about biases that, that may get introduced. So there are, you, know, you have to be conscious about that. There are a bunch of DevOps tools, but new tools are required as we went through in the data processing, data management, data acquisition, data quality checking, data annotation, and uh, making sure that you're plotting the learning curves because the model is not always accurate. Um, evaluating the models. So there are many more tools that are required on top of the traditional software development. And the output, as designed, tested, it works, but in, a, in an AI model, it's not 100% accurate, and you have to kind of, customers have to live with that. When we released the initial AI model, there was a lot of high hype and expectations, and customers expected it to work at 99% accuracy. And it's only after a lot of uh, struggle and that we had to kind of recalibrate the expectations to say, hey, you know, first iteration of AI models, you know, don't expect 90% accuracy. You know, you have to kind of work with us to get your data so we can improve it over time, right? So uh, that's what happens. Debugging, explainability. Well, you can put um, actually debug points and, and uh, debug what's happening. But if it's a deep learning model, <laughs> good luck, right? <laughs> you don't know what it's doing inside the, all those networks. And, but there are some algorithms uh, that are emerging now to, um, like Lyme algorithm, that will help you to explain the behavior of the model, but it's still after the fact. Um, a whole set of new roles are needed. You know, data manager, vendor relationship manager, data quality manager, data annotations, data scientists whole new world out here that, um, that we have to manage and how they, all these players work with uh, the traditional ones. Testing depends, a lot of times, depends on perception. So you have to also take into account who is the receiver of the, the AI model and what, how do they perceive it as. User experience. Um, 
yeah, uncontrolled, sometimes depends on perception. It's kind of uh, uh, have to be managed. So just the way software development methodology has a scorecard, um, I, I've come up with this uh, scorecard for AI maturity. So you can create uh, in the dimensions of methods, processes, tools, you know, what is your maturity in managing your data pipeline? And each of these opens up into a whole you know, dozens of uh, uh, specific questions that when you answer, you know where you stand on this. So at least you know where you are and where you need to get to, right? How do you do the data pipeline management? How do you do the feature preparation, the train test pipeline, data lineage management, model versioning lineage management, bias and error analysis, the service level agreement for the, can you always guarantee 90% accuracy on any given model? Model outcome, the explainability of the model, the behavior uh, as the, how does the model behave and drift over time based on you know, what's happening in the world, um, data compliance, AI operations automation, and whole, whole bunch of suites. So um, uh, I have actually more detailed ones, but you guys have to invite me next time for another talk, so <laughs> I can take you through some of them. So in the interest of time, I'll just wrap it up. Uh, best practices. Um, manage data pipeline thoughtfully and consciously. Accelerate learning by scoping uh, the problem, right? That's the, the learning curves that I talked about. Establish the purpose of the AI model, that is 80% of the time gets spent on actually a whole bunch of other steps than the training and testing. So make sure you write your test cases first and declare your biases. Um, understand that AI model isn't going to be perfect in the first iteration. Build systematic model diagnostics, error analysis, and model revision management into the processes. And then continuous learning of this AI model has to be baked into these methods, tools, and processes. And I also talked about uh, how AI mo model is, uh, building an AI model so is very different from a traditional software one. Uh, be aware of it and be conscious as we build it. And then measure and monitor the maturity of the processes using some kind of that maturity scorecard type of thing that I had shared. So let me pause here and open it up for any questions you may have. Yeah, go ahead. So I'll start with the second question. Uh, that, as a data scientist, I, all I'm saying is that you have to ask those questions and, uh, and try different models with and without and see if you really need those, dis those d models for discrimination or not as a discriminatory variables. Um, I have heard, I mean, I, I, we haven't personally built it ourselves, uh, but I've heard from other companies when I was at a panel the other day um, where they said that they consciously actually excluded those variables from their uh, data models because all things being equal, they, they felt that those should not play a role in loan approvals. So, but it's an organizational business decision rather than a, um, actually an, uh, a technical decision. Because in their case, what they, what they did was they actually chose to um, let go of some amount of accuracy on their model um, in, um, uh, in, in preference for uh, the print standing on the principle. So it's a very interesting example of where they said, I, I'm okay to live with the, for it to be a little bit less accurate. Even if I end up giving a loan to somebody who is not worth it, I just don't want to be on the other side of the line where I'm discriminating people on age and gender. So it's a business decision sometimes. Okay, so the first question you asked is um, continuous learning. Can, should data scientists stick with an AI model or can they move on to building another exciting one? Um, so a lot of things in continuous learning can be automated. Okay, if not everything, but it takes uh, you know ca a lot of good amount of effort and um, a lot of testing. But uh, when the payload data or new new data comes in, you could build in tools for doing sampling. You could build in tools for automatically retraining. You could build in tools for testing different models. You could build in thresholds to make sure that you will only release a model when it crosses a certain threshold and so on. So you could automate that process, but you know still you want to be in the loop and uh, you, you because. These are part of business critical applications and you, you don't want to release something without looking at it. Um, so I would say you, you have to stick on, you or somebody else who takes it on as, a, um, uh, as, a, as part of support. So this, these are all part of the processes that we have to develop, right? You know, there is a software developer who builds a piece of software and then there is a, uh, a maintenance and support team that supports traditional software, right? So similarly, you know, a set of data scientists, maybe very high powered ones will build the models, but then, you know, a set of the, uh, you know, an additional, you know, uh, maintenance team is trained on the model and they maintain them and they keep checking on a regular basis the continuous improvements are actually making sense or not. Other questions? So if it is an AI model and there is actually a real business case that's needed for that AI model to exist in their business process, 
then it probably cannot be rep re replaced with a traditional software application. Right? If you can, then why would you go for building an AI model that's probabilistic and that's not going to be 100% accurate? So it's only when you, you insert an AI model into your business process, only when there is a good justification for it and a business case for it. Having said that, once you insert it, um, this has to be a, an education and part of the conversation with the clients that, um, that you know, it has to learn in situ. Once it's deployed, based on the environment, the type of data, that what happens in their company, it has to learn and it will get better. But what you as a, a supplier or a vendor of that AI uh, service have to be really um, good at is to build out those tools that will uh, be needed to improve that model continuously in situ. So I wouldn't compare with you know, an AI model with a traditional software one because you would insert an AI model only when there is a good reason why you want to insert it. And, and because it's, you know, it's, a, it's a problem that's, that's you know, non-deterministic or probabilistic, and uh, you know, right, if, you, if you can write a traditional software application that can just do you know, data manipulation, and you would do that. Right? Why would you go for you know, the whole all trouble of getting data, training it, and, and put up with the, the mistakes that it makes and all that? There was a question yeah. right there. Oh. Great presentation. So uh, you mentioned something uh, previously uh, where the accuracy was not there. I hope it was not Watson. <laughs> which, which one are you talking about? Uh, a couple of slides back, uh, you were saying the, the system couldn't recognize the words appropriately. Um, no, the, actually, that's not just for you know that happens for any any uh, AI service, right? It's not just for you know any particular vendor's one. That's unless you train it on every domain under the sun and have it be so good at all those domains, it's only natural that in the first iteration it, these things will trip up. And some of the examples that I gave that uh, uh, AT&T versus uh, Infosys empathy and right. it's empty. That happened across the board when I tested it on multiple. Uh, so so the, my real question was, uh, it seems like you have tested multiple platforms for AI. I mean, is there a published guide or by either IBM or somebody else uh, in the industry which compares these uh, platforms for AI today? There are many um, third party uh, evaluators who you know, m measure these platforms on many different dimensions. And as with any software product, depending on who you are asking that question, they would say, you know, ours does better, I don't trust this, whatnot. But there are many dimensions of, of evaluating. Uh, uh, when I say a platform, actually there are many things to it, right? The cloud platform, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the actual, um, the accuracy of the AI services. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, increasingly these things are becoming commodity services, right? The speech to text, text to speech, natural language understanding. They are kind of uh, table stakes services, and uh, and it's it's a um, few percentage points difference here and there between you know the large vendors. You take Google, Microsoft, IBM, you know some of the the bigger ones. Yeah, a few depending on who has more data and who has uh, more uh, you know annotation capability and all that, and a few percentage points here and there. But they're overall they're more and more becoming commoditized. So that's why it's so important. Uh, at least we believe that our incumbency is in enterprise market. So we want to be good at solving problems for clients in enterprises, and that's the market that you know we want these AI services to work well in. We don't necessarily you know compete in. Um, everything we, we go after the enterprise market so that's where that's why it's so important for us to draw some of these insights that you have to customize for industry industries and domains thank you appreciate all the attendees for staying